Can somebody let me know if they can hear me and see the slides? Yes, we can hear you and we can see the slides. Thank you very, very, very much. I just, I just want to make a comment here. If you register in as iPhone, it's going to be very hard for me to tell who you are as attendance wise. Okay. iPhone and iPad, you might want to change your name so you can at least put your name up there. You know, if that's a possibility, if it's not a possibility, let me know, but it should be a possibility. But I've got an iPad and an iPhone, and I'll have to check, but I don't know if I can find out who that is. Probably not. Uh, but just just that to mention to you, just this is on our second class. Uh, the plan today is to go through the lecture. I've already given this lecture this morning. It took about 45 minutes, and then we go through the chemistry lab. Uh, uh, and I give you hints and tell you how to do the chemistry lab, uh, uh, just like I did before with the anatomical lab. Uh, it, you saw yesterday how I put out the weekly thing. That will be coming out on Sunday. It gives you the lecture, it gives you the lab, and it gives you the assignments that have been assigned to date, okay, and when they're due. So everything's been assigned, even if it's at some time in the future, like with Pearson assignments for chapter one, that or do when the when the uh, 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 exam closes or the uh, introduction if you want to do it you know do it at the end of the month uh, for two extra credit points I put the assignments down and then I keep adding to them and if it's a past to do if it's an assignment that's already been passed you I take it out I know there's a reminder on Canvas but I prefer to do it this way that reminds me what you got uh, assigned. And that reminds you, so it's very difficult for you to send me an email uh, to t say, hey, I didn't know that was due. And my first question to you, have you been reading the weekly announcements? And the answer is usually no, okay? Uh, at, you know, there, when the class started, there was a whole bunch of announcements, but now it'll be pretty much the login information. Uh, you have to make a revision to the calendar of activities. Uh, you know, if the, uh, Dean tells me to post something or send it out, then something like that. Uh, but it won't be nearly as many as announcements. But if you get announcements, you ought to check it to see what it is, uh, to see what's going on. We're going to talk about uh, organic chemistry, and then we're going to talk, focus on the part of organic chemistry, which is called the macromolecules. That's carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. It shouldn't take very long. Molecules, uh, so organic chemistry, especially these molecules. Organic chemistry deals with compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. Obviously, uh, obviously, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, doesn't contain hydrogen, so it's not an organic compound. It's an inorganic compound. The four we're going to look at are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. They're very important in anatomy and physiology. Carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? They contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is the structural unit of the, mo the monosaccharide. You do not have to memorize this, okay? It, and under no stretch of the imagination, you have to memorize it. You don't even have to recognize it, okay? But it is a carbohydrate. It, occur it occurs in a ring structure. By convention, rather than writing carbon at every place where this junction uh, is there's uh, by convention there's a carbon here so this is one two three four five six carbon ring structure this is a carbohydrate carbohydrates are covalently bonded remember where there's three types of bonds there's a covalent bond which is the strongest where elements share electrons atoms shares electrons okay the next strongest bond is the ionic bond and then the hydrogen bond is the weakest bond okay primary function is quick energy supply for the body we need carbohydrates for quick energy. Again, I will reiterate to you, do not go into a exam having been on a carbohydrate scarce diet like the Atkins diet or something like that prior to the exam because your brain needs glucose, okay? It runs on glucose. It can run on other things, but it affects your mental activity. In fact, if anything, you'd want to, to load carbs a little bit, but that's easy to do. You just bring in a soda or something with sugar in it. And you can you can take care of that. They're, 
They're classified by size. A monosaccharide has a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen ratio of one to two to one. The most famous one or the one that's most often quoted is glucose, which is C6H12O6. Why is that important? Because that's one of the products of uh, photosynthesis. Plants take CO2 from the air, uh, water from the ground, and in the presence of sunlight, they convert that to glucose and oxygen, okay? So there are a number of uh, monosaccharides. The ones that are important are glucose, fructose, galactose. Those are the six carbons, okay? And then the five carbons you've already heard of, deoxyribose, that's the five carbon sugar in DNA, and ribose is the five carbon sugar in RNA. You do not have to be able to recognize them. You ought to know the name, okay? But you don't have, you know, you won't have a ring structure like that and say, is that deoxyribose or ribose? The answer is no. You need to know that deoxyribose is in DNA and ribose is in RNA. Carbohydrates can be from three to seven carbons, but we deal with the five and six carbon ones. A six carbon uh, a monosaccharide, monosaccharide just means one unit, okay, it's a hexose. Uh, we have glucose, we have fructose and galactose. These are all isomers, okay. Remember, an isomer has the same number of atoms, okay, but arranged in a three-dimensional uh, trajectory different. Then we, have the ri then we have ribose, which is five carbons called a pentose. So any five carbon monosaccharide be called a pentose. Any six carbon monosaccharide would be called a hexose. These are the ones that are most common. These are uh, the five and six carbon ones. Well, how do we join these? We join these by dehydration. We'll go over that in a little bit, okay? And glucose and uh, fructose, okay? Glucose and fructose are sucrose. That's our table sugar. Glucose in and of itself is not very sweet, okay? Glucose in and of itself is not very sweet. Glucose and glucose joined together is lactose and galactose and glucose is, is excuse me, that's lactose, this is maltose, okay? This is lactose here. This is uh, uh, fruit sugar and maltose is the sugar produced with fermentation. They have to be broken down uh, through hydrolysis. Uh, when you put them together, you do dehydration uh, synthesis. In other words, you take water out when you break, when you put it, when you break them down, you put water back in. Polysaccharides are created by dehydration synthesis. They're ideal storage products. This is what glycogen looks like. It's a big, long, multiple, multiple chains of uh, uh, monosaccharides. And the storage product in plants is starch. The storage product in animals is glycogen. So you ought to remember that. So that's all you need to know about glucose. Primarily five carbon, six carbon, the five carbons we deal with are deoxyribose and ribose. And then six carbon sugars, the most famous one is, is, is glucose. We put them together by dehydration synthesis. Uh, a polysaccharide is how glucose is stored in plants. It's stored in plants as starch and animals as glycogen. And we go in there by hydrolysis and break those down so that we can use glucose. These are the four lipids we're gonna study. Triglycerides have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but they're not in, in, a, in a one to two to one ratio. They have less oxygen, so it wouldn't be one to two to one, but they still have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're insoluble in water. Long-term energy storage and cell membrane component. This is a triglyceride, okay? A triglyceride consists of a glycerol backbone <coughs> and three fatty acids. These are long chain fatty acids. So this is a glycerol backbone and three long chain fatty acids. That's why it's called triglycerides. Glycerol backbone, three long chain fatty acids. And how do we put them together? We take water out. We take a hydrogen here and we take an OH from there. We put those together, that comes out and we form this bond between the oxygen and the carbon there, okay? And so we form this bond bet uh, between the oxygen and carbon, and this is a triglyceride. We have those long chain fatty acids can be saturated, which means there's no carbon-carbon double bonds, and every carbon has the maximum amount of hydrogens it can have. So this carbon's attached to one carbon there and one carbon there, 
And so it has two hydrogens. The same thing with this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon. The N carbon has three hydrogens, okay? This is a saturated fat. This is an animal fat. This is a linear molecule, which means it can be stacked. This would be like a ream when you go to buy a printing paper and you buy a ream 500 sheets and it, it's in this little, it's in this packet, you know, that's about two, three inches thick, okay? That would be 500 of these saturated fat molecules stacked on one another. That's one of the reasons why it's so bad. It's so dense. The other reason why it's so, <clears throat> it's animal fat. It's, it's, <coughs> Sorry about my voice, this is my third lecture today. It's uh, saturated fat, it's animal fat, uh, and it's not the good kind of fat. This is unsaturated fat. Notice we can have some carbon-carbon double bonds, and when we do that, we don't have, this carbon doesn't have two hydrogens, it only has one, okay? It only has the one hydrogen here. So in unsaturated fats, we have carbon-carbon double bonds, and we have less hydrogens uh, on the carbon-carbon where the carbon-carbon is double bonded because carbon can normally only have four bonds, okay, because of its valence, it has four valence electrons. And notice when we have a carbon-carbon double bond, that puts a kink in the molecule. These are our vegetable oils, okay? Well, I know what I wanted to say. This is a... This is a solid at room temperature. That's your butter, okay? This is a liquid at room temperature. This is your vegetable oil, okay? This is vegetable oil here. And this is one of the, these are usually found in plant oils, okay? We have come up with a process. We, we want to be healthy, but we don't like these unsaturated fats, so we make trans fats. And through a chemical process, we are able to add, even though this is a carbon-carbon double bond, this carbon has one, two, three, four, five. It's bonding with five, it has five bonds here, okay? And this is a special instance where we have actually, through a chemical manipulation, added a hydrogen bond back. And so we've made it, we, we have resaturated the thing. So this is a trans fat. Okay, so we talked about triglycerides. It was a glycerol backbone with three long chain fatty acids that can be saturated or unsaturated. So a phospholipid is the same thing except for one of the long chain fatty acids is a phosphate group. So here's your glycerol backbone, same thing we had before. Here's a saturated fat and unsaturated fat just to illustrate it. And then here's your phosphate group. So that's the difference between a triglyceride. Triglyceride has a glycerol backbone and three long chain fatty acids. Phospholipid has a glycerol backbone, two long chain fatty acids, and instead of the third fatty acid, we have a phosphate group. And this makes this unique, okay? In the fact the phosphate group is charged, okay? So it will attract polar substances as opposed to the fat portion. We already looked at that where you know that fats and oils are, Water and fats don't mix, okay? Oils and water don't mix. Phospholipids covalently bonded to glycerol backbone, two long chain fatty acids, and a phosphate group, which makes it amphiphilic, which means it has a polar end, charged end, and two nonpolar ends. So if you can imagine putting a phospholipid in a cell membrane with the polar end here and the lipid end here, and the same thing because in the, in the cell membrane, we have two of them. So we have the polar in here and polar in there. Liquids, water is a charged molecule, can come up to the cell membrane and discharge whatever they're carrying, okay? And then the, phospho <clears throat> then the long chain fatty acids and the cell membrane can regulate what goes through, okay? And we'll look at that way more detail next lecture. But the illustration point of this is, it's not that difficult to learn because the only difference between a triglyceride and a phospholipid is the fact that one of the long chain fatty acids is a phosphate group. A steroid is a four carbon ring with side chains, okay? It's four hydrocarbon rings. These are four rings. One, two, three, four, okay? And each place would have a carbon here and that'd be carbon, carbon, double bond there, carbon, carbon. And these are side chains. So it's a it's not it's uh, no fatty acids. It's just four ring. It's four rings with four with different side chains. 
most famous steroid that we deal with is cholesterol, used to make vitamin D, steroid hormones, bile salts, and corticosteroids. You'll get into that more in anatomy and physiology too. Icosanoids are the last, categ <clears throat> the last category of, uh, of uh, fatty acids. They influence cell function regulate blood pressure, smooth muscle contraction. They, they are mediators. They do a whole lot of different things, okay? They're mediators and they do a whole lot of different things. Proteins are our next category. So already we went through the carbohydrates and we went through the lipids. Now the proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. All the proteins contain that. Some of the R groups, which are the variable groups in the amino acids, we have 20 amino acids, may contain sulfur or phosphorus. The structural unit of the amino acid, the structural unit of the amino acid, of the protein is the amino acid. You should know this. Every amino acid has a central carbon. This is a central carbon. It has a single hydrogen attached to it. It has an amino group. It's called an amino acid, okay? NH2 is an amino group. All right, that's why it has the nitrogen in it. And CWOH is the carboxy group. This is the acid group. It's called an amino acid. This is your R group, which is variable, okay? You do not need to know the 20 amino acids. The only one I remember is, is glycine because it has a hydrogen as its R group. So it's the simplest one. Spartic acid has this group here. Uh, lysine has that group there. And cysteine has that group there. You don't have, you just need to know there's 20 amino acids. You need to know the basic structure, a central carbon. The carbon's got four attachments. One of them is an amino group, NH2. One of them is an acid group, CWOH. One's a single hydrogen. And the other is an R group. The R group determines which amino acid it is. Oh, in my last lecture, Anatomy and Physiology 2, we had 312 slides. Proteins are made up of amino acids. There's 20 types. Here's just one, two, three. Here's one, two, three, four types of them, okay? Amino acids are joined. Guess what? They're joined by dehydration synthesis. That keeps, keeps coming back, okay? We take a OH off of the acid group and an H off of the amino group within... Uh, water comes out as a as a uh, as a byproduct, and they are joined here. The carbon, instead of being joined to an oxygen, is now joined to a nitrogen. How do we separate these? If we wanted to break this up, yesterday I had meatballs. They were beef. Okay, I cannot utilize cow protein, but I can utilize cow amino acids. So hydrolysis underwent hydrolysis and broke these apart, and then I, I had the component amino acids to be able to utilize. Changing a single amino acid changes the characteristic of a protein. Four levels of structure, okay? The, you'll think this is complicated, but it's not. Primary structure, you've got the amino acids in a row. You've got 100 amino acids in a row. You start at one end and start naming them, and you name all 100, okay? In position number 95, you say there's glycine because that's what was there, okay? And and position number 50 is aspartic acid, but you just name them from start to finish, okay? That's the primary structure. Name them from start to finish is primary structure. That's simple. These are bonded by peptide bonds. That's a <clears throat> because we, we bond it to the, that's the protein bond, and that's in a linear structure, okay? Notice here, there you have a R group here, an R group here, an R group here, an R group here. Okay, notice you have R groups. Notice you have hydrogens. Okay, notice you have hydrogens. Hydrogens are attached to nitrogen here. Hydrogens are attached to carbon there. But these hydrogens that are attached to nitrogen may be able to form hydrogen bonds. Secondary structure you have two different structures. You have an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. A beta pleated sheet is just like pleats in your pants. Okay, or if you took a piece of paper and sort of pushed it together and you had waves going up and down, that's beta pleated sheets, okay? An alpha helix is just a helix twisted in an alpha direction. These are interactions, these structures are due to interactions 
and locally means in close proximity by hydrogen bonds with another electronegative atom. Usually, usually, usually it could be this oxygen. Remember this oxygen is an electronegative atom, okay? It shares these electrons with carbon, but it shares them unequally. And so if you had a if you had this hydrogen bond, this hydrogen here, and this got this got folded a little bit, and we'll find out that the folding is done in the Golgi apparatus where it's folded, okay? These could form these either a beta pleated sheet or an alpha helix. So that's how we get a secondary structure. Secondary structure is either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. And that's due to the interaction of hydrogen bonds. Tertiary bonds bend and fold from interaction from distant R groups. These you may have, you know, you may have 3,000 amino acids, and you may have the R group of amino acid number three react, react with the R group of amino acid number 200. Okay, but this this causes the unique folding of the protein. Each protein, each individual protein has a unique folding structure, and this causes that structure. And so it's due to the interaction among the R groups. Secondary structures due to interaction locally, locally among the hydrogen bonds, uh, the uh, tertiary structure is the folding of the protein, okay? And it's due to the interaction of the R groups. Remember some of the R, well, you don't know this, but some of the R groups are polar, okay? Which means they have a charge so they can interact. And then finally, quaternary structure. The quintessential example of this is hemoglobin, where you have two alpha and two beta structures. They're called globulins, but these are just tertiary proteins that are put together to form a quaternary structure. So that's the structure. You have primary structure, which is the just the naming from one, you know, from the start to the finish. The secondary structure is alpha helix or beta pleated sheets due to hydrogen bonding locally. Tertiary structure is the, the original uh, individual folding of each individual protein based on its arrangement of amino acids. So if you have, for whatever reason, have a substitution of an amino acid that was supposed to be responsible for the folding, okay, because it had a polar R group, you won't get that folding, and that amino acid might not be, fun or excuse me, that protein might not be functional because it won't fold like it, like it needs to fold, okay? So that's, that's interaction of the R groups and tertiary. And then finally, quaternary is when you bring uh, two or more of these uh, tertiary structures together into one molecule. And like I say, this is the hemoglobin molecule. That will be next semester for you. Another piece of advice, if you're taking anatomy and physiology one now, do not, take, do not wait too long to take two, either take it in the spring or the summer, because as you're well aware, knowledge falls off precipitously if you don't use it. You can de so this is our folded protein. We can denature it either with chemicals or heat. Okay. Once we do that, we unfold it. When we unfold it, it's no longer functional. It still has its primary structure. You could still start here and name it all the way to end, but it doesn't have this unique folding and it needs that folding to react. You can classify them based on shape and function, fibrous or strand like, structural. We will look at these when we look at chapter four, collagen, keratin, spectrum, and elastin. Movement, actin, and myosin, that's responsible for muscle contraction. We will look at that in chapters nine and 10, when we go on muscle. That just comes in too early. Globulins, we talked about some globulins carrying hemoglobin. Uh, they also can be responsible for transport of membrane pumps, regulation of pH, regulation of metabolism, hormone like insulin, body defenses, antibodies, protein management, molecular chaperones, aid with folding and repair and breakdown of damaged proteins. These are just all functions, okay? And then finally, one of the, one of the, well, they're all important, but this is a very important one. Pro, some proteins are enzymes and, form, and uh, cause reactions to speed up significantly from hundreds of thousands to millions of times faster. This is a model of an enzyme. So this would be a protein. It has two active binding sites for substrate. So these might be two amino acids that need to go together. 
Number one, we need those specific amino acids. It will only fit glycine and aspartic acid. Okay, it only fit that those amino acids in there. Once those amino acids, and it and it only fit them where the amino group is lined up, the NH2 group is lined up to the CWOH group. Because if they're not lined up like that, if the amino groups lined up to the amino group, they're not going to bond together. Okay, so it it, it puts the it puts the substrate here, undergoes a configurational change. Okay, now these groups are lined up. These groups are lined up. Water is uh, released, and they are bonded. What's the once the peptide bond is formed? That's the bond in amino acids between the CWOH and the NH2. Then the enzyme releases the dipeptide and it goes back to catalyze another reaction if it's needed. So it's not change, it just holds the substrate together, make sure it's in the correct configuration so the reaction can occur. It's called a lock and key model. They're specific for uh, uh, the, the specific substrates. Substrates are whatever is gonna be bonded together, whatever whatever reactants, okay, whatever, what, whatever's on the left side of the chemical equation needs to come together, okay? Different enzyme for every reaction in the body. Because we, we generate a lot of energy, but if we had to utilize all energy to push all the reactions, okay, we'd probably run out of energy. You need an activation energy to get reactants, okay? If we're talking about photosynthesis, that would be CO2 plus water. And our products would be glucose plus water. Uh, CO2 plus water, our clocks would be glucose C6H2O6 plus oxygen. This is sunlight, okay? This is sunlight. This is our activation energy, okay? With an enzyme, with an enzyme in another reaction, okay, with an enzyme in another reaction, we have significantly reduced the energy required to go from reactants to products. And so this is what enzymes do. They lower activation energy, increase speed by and can increase speed by a million fold. They can't force a reaction. So if those two things don't react, they're not going to react, and they can't change a reaction. It is only for a specific reaction. And as you read two slides ago, there's probably an enzyme for every reaction in the body. And this is what we looked at previously. If 3D shape is disrupted, this is this is a biological active protein, okay? Every once in a while it does that in the, during the day. If you get kicked off, see if you get kicked back on. If not, this is being recorded. Uh, this is an active protein. If we denature it with chemicals or heat, okay, it's no longer an active protein. Nucleic acids is our fourth kind of a macromolecule. It contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrous, uh, nitrogen, and phosphorus, okay? Structure unit is the nucleotide, okay? This is a nucleotide here. This is the adenine nucleotide. It has a one, two, three, four, five carbon sugar, okay? This is DNA, so this is, this is, ri this is ribose. This is our phosphate group. This is why there's a P there, okay? And this is our base, okay? This is adenine. The, the bases in, uh, in DNA are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And adenine binds to thymine and cytosine binds to guanine. We'll cover that more next chapter in chapter three, okay? But this is a nucleotide. This is a nucleotide here. This is the thymine nucleotide. This is your ribose sugar. This is your phosphate group, okay? The ribose sugar and the phosphate group make up the backbone of DNA. And then your base pairs make up this, the stair-like the stair organization. This is what DNA looks like. This is how it looks like. This was done in my lifetime, okay? Now, I didn't know about it. Obviously, the paper for DNA came out in 1952, okay, from Watson and Crick. Before then, there was a theory, there was theories that there was nuclear, excuse me, they, they knew there was genetic material in the nucleus, they just didn't know what the structure was, okay? And so before this was done, we did, you know, we didn't have DNA typing or any of that stuff, okay? Chromosome typing. Uh, and so they eluc elucidated the structure of DNA and that, like I say, that's been in my lifetime now. That came out in 1952. And notice that the base pairs in DNA are A, T, and C, G. 
we have a deoxyribose phosphate, deoxyribose phosphate as the backbone. This is the double helix. And with the A, T, C, and G, the base pairs binding uh, as the stair, as the stair things, and they bind by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the weakest of bonds, but when you have a couple of million of them together, that's a pretty strong bond. RNA is different. It has, uh, RNA has, uh, DNA has deoxyribose for sugar. I may say ribose. It has deoxyribose for sugar. RNA has ribose for the sugar. It has A, C, G, U. It doesn't have thymine. It has uracil, okay? It is single-stranded as opposed to double-stranded. It is found inside the nucleus and outside the nucleus. DNA is found primarily in the nucleus, although there is some mitochondrial DNA, okay? There are three types of DNA, of RNA, okay? Uh, mRNA, T, uh, rRNA, and tRNA. We'll discuss those in chapter three. But this is a single-stranded thing. This is ATP, okay? This is our ribose sugar. This is adenine. And instead of one phosphate group, we've got one, two, three. This is our energy source for the body. This is ATP. So we take our nucleotide, okay? It's very similar to our nucleotide. The nucleotide only has one phosphate. We add a second phosphate to it, that's ADP, adenine uh, diphosphate, and adenosine diphosphate. And then we add a third phosphate to it, it's adenosine triphosphate. So this is this bond right here, this bond between the second and third phosphate has a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of energy. So when we break down glucose in our body, okay, we, we break down glucose in the presence of oxygen, we come up with CO2, water, and between 30 and 36 units of ATP. When the body needs energy, it breaks ATP and ADP plus phosphate and energy is released and available for use. It has all kinds of uses. We're right now, for the people who are awake, you're spending, uh, everybody's awake, you're, you're, you're using billions of units of ATP in your brain to, to watch, these, watch these slides and listen to me talk. Energy is used for transport, for muscle contraction, for reactions. In summary, okay, this is the last slide. Like I say, it doesn't take very long. We, we talked about the four macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. They each have individualized structures. They each contain carbon and hydrogen. They add different elements. So you need to know the elements. You need to know the basic structures of them. You'll not have to draw. You'll not have to pick. You'll never look at a structure and try to determine what it is, okay? But like for a triglyceride, you know it's a glycerol backbone and three long chain fatty acids, okay? So if you saw that in the multiple choice question, you could pick that out. A phospholipid is a glycerol backbone, two long chain fatty acids, and the phosphate group, okay? Inorganic is non-living, usually no carbon, ionic bonds, smaller molecules, water, salts, acids, and bases. Organic is living, carbon-based, covalent bonds, large molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And that's the last slide there. So let's look at, and I'll take questions in a minute, but let's look at the chemistry lab module. Okay, this is the chemistry lab module. If you downloaded it before yesterday, I revised it because it was a mess before. I'd put it together for the summer class and I didn't like how it was put together. So I made it easier and it made it more readable. Okay, so if you downloaded it before, this is the revised version here. This is, you know, you do it. This is a Word document, last name, first name, lab underscore chemistry lab module. Then you go, go to the assignments. All right, these are definitions. They are not all in your notes. They're not all on the slides. There are a couple of them, maybe three or four of them that we didn't talk about, but they are important enough that you should go to Google and put the name in and uh, come up with the definition. The only caveat I have about that is make sure you get the chemistry definition. Because if you get the, you know, the, Oh, uh, cafeteria definition, that doesn't do us any good. That's not a chemistry term, okay? So make sure, I mean, you know what atomic mass is. That's the weight of the protons. 
and the neutrons. Atomic number is the number in the chem is the number of protons. Electron configuration we talked about. These don't have to be long. You know, a sentence or two about about the definition. And there's there is 22 of them. Okay, so if you don't if you don't have it in your notes, if you don't if you don't have it in the student notes and don't have it on slides, just Google it and put the definition there. Okay, and you'll learn something in the process. Okay, atomic number and mass number. For this, you'll need a periodic table. I'm going to get mine. Hold on. How do you get a period? How do you get a periodic table? You go to Google, put in periodic table, and either download it, print it out, or just leave it up there while you're doing it. You're going to take. Sometimes it has the element name. Sometimes it has the atomic number. Sometimes it has the number of protons. Sometimes it has the number of neutrons. Sometimes it has the mass number. Okay, which is also the atomic mass. Mass number and atomic mass are the same thing. Well, carbon has an atomic number of six, okay? Carbon has an atomic number of six. If it has an atomic number of six, has an atomic number of six, it, that means it has six protons. Well, its mass number is 12. The mass number is the sum of the atomic mass units of protons and neutrons. We know it has six protons. So in order to get to 12, we subtract six from 12 and we get six. So you fill that in. Now you don't know what this is, but you know the atomic number. So you look on the atomic number and this happens to be oxygen with an atomic number of eight. Well, we know if it has an atomic number of eight, it must have eight protons. And so we put an eight in here. Okay, we'd write oxygen there, type it in. We'd put eight there. Eight plus eight has a mass number of 16 and we'll look it up and lo and behold, it does. So these are, this, this was a huge table before, okay? And I took out all the hard ones and just, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All you need is a periodic table. And it has enough information to be able to figure it out. What does the atomic number and the, note and the number of protons relate to each other? Well, the atomic number tells you the number of protons. Atomic number doesn't tell you the number of electrons, but every element on the periodic table is electrically neutral as it sits on the periodic table. So if it has six, if carbon has six protons, that's six positive charges, it has to have six electrons. What do the number of protons, number of neutrons, and mass number relate to each other? Well, the mass number tells you the sum of the weight of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. What's the one thing that determines the identity of an atom? It's the number of protons, okay? If it has a different number of protons, it's a different identity. All right, this has to do with ions, okay? Ions are elements are a group of elements we didn't deal with group of elements but elements that have gained or lost electrons and because they have gained or lost an electrons they have developed a charge ions are elements that have gained or lost electrons and they, the reason they do that is try to achieve a stable configuration remember we're um, you're trying except for the first principal energy level which only has hydrogen and helium in it we're trying to get an octet we're trying to get an octet, and so we're trying to get eight electrons in the outermost shell. But these only deal with ions, okay? So these are metals and nonmetals. These are the two extremes of the periodic table, one on the left side and one on the right side. That ions are elements that gain or lose electrons, and because they get, gain or lose electrons, they develop a charge. If you lose an electron, you still have the same number of positive charges, but you've lost a negative charge, so you've developed a positive charge. If you gain electrons, you still have the same number of positive charges, but you gain an electron, so now you have a negative charge. So here's potassium here. Potassium has a atomic number of 19. Potassium has an atomic number of 19, so that means it has 19 protons. But it has a plus one, a one plus charge, okay? Well, if it has 19 protons, 19 positive charges, but it's plus one, it must have 18 electrons. 19 positives, 18 negatives, that gives you a plus one charge. This is how you write it with an element, but it'd be a plus one charge here. Barium, okay, barium on your periodic table has an atomic number 56. Barium means that it has 56 protons. It has a charge of two plus. That means it has 56 positive charges, we can't change the positive charges. That positive charges designate the number of protons, which designates the identity of the element. 
Barium is always going to have 56 protons. The only thing that can be changed are electrons. We can take them away or we can add them. Barium in its outermost shell only has two electrons. It's unlikely to take six electrons from something else as an ionic bond, so it's going to lose its two electrons. So it has, I said it had 56 positive charges. It has a charge of two plus, so it must have 54 electrons. And that will give you a charge of two plus. And then I'll leave iron with you. Okay. Oxygen has a, as an ion, has a charge of two minus. Okay. As an ion. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. That means it has eight protons. Its atomic number is eight. It has to have eight protons. It has a two minus charge. It has eight positive charges. How many negative charges do we have to have to get to the two minus? Well, we need 10. If we had nine, it would charge to be my, uh, one minus, but it's two minus. So it has eight protons, it has 10 electrons, and its charge is minus two, okay? So that's that, you just go through that table. Here's a word list for these questions. Some of them we didn't go over, but after you eliminate everything else, you'll come down, you, like Rutherford and Thompson, we didn't go over, they were in Lavoisier, they were famous people in chemistry, and so, You'll learn a lot of, you'll learn a little bit about it, but this is the word list that belongs to these. You just go down to here and put the, put, type them in, okay? Half-lives, this is what confuses a lot of people, okay? What is a half-life? At the end of a half-life, I'm going to have half of what I had to start with. At year zero, I have an element that has a hundred year half-life. At year zero, I have 100 grams. At year zero, I have 100 grams. At year 100, which is one half life, I have 50 grams because I have it has undergone radioactive decay. It has undergone radioactive decay, and now I only have 50 grams left. At year 200, which is the second half life, I. At year, so you could you could start you could make your chart if you want to. At year zero, I got a hundred. At year one hundred, I got fifty. A hundred years passed, and again now year two hundred, I got twenty five. At year three hundred, I got twelve point five. At year four hundred, I got six point two five. And that's all there is to half lives. That is all there is to half lives. So the question says, you got strontium ninety has a half life of twenty eight years. You start with hundred grams. In the year 2020, how many grams of strontium 90 would you have after 28 years? That's one half life. So if you started with 100 grams, you'd have 50 grams. How many, how much would you have after 56 years? That's two half lives. So you just half the 50 grams. So that's not hard. And I, I gave you an example up here to read. Okay, so I redid this. Okay. Why are half lives good? Because we talked about carbon 12 and carbon 14. Carbon 14 has a half life of 5,000 and something years, and there's a ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 14. And so we can use that for carbon dating, okay? And theoretically, with the amount in your, that's 32 grams uh, sample here. I switched that to 100. I didn't change that question, okay? I'll have to revise that. All right. You should say 100 grams. Uh, ever be zero grams? If, if why or why not? Well, you keep having it, so you can't you can't half something and get to zero. You can get you keep having it till you can't measure it. 20 years from now, you can measure it, but you can't measure it. Okay, so theoretically, it never gets to zero. Okay, would it be a good thing for finding out how old dinosaur fossils are? No, because its half life is too short. You know, carbon 14 has a half life of 5,000 years. This has a half life of 28 years. Wouldn't be very long before you couldn't measure it, okay? Now, then we're gonna talk about isotopes. We talked about that, it's in the slides. This literally is in the slides, okay? We talked about carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. What is an isotope? An isotope is an element that has the same atomic number, the same number of protons, the same number of, of electrons, a different number of neutrons and a different atomic mass because it has a has the same number of protons but a different number of uh, neutrons so it has a different atomic mass 
And so we talked about carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Their, their atomic numbers are all six because it's carbon. Carbon has an atomic number of six. Their atomic mass is right here. It's carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, so it's 12, 13, and 14. How many protons do they have? The atomic number is six, so they all have six protons. How many electrons they have? Every element on the periodic table, as it stands on the periodic table, is electrically neutral, so it has six electrons. The only thing different is the number of protons. Excuse me, the number of neutrons. The only thing different is the number of neutrons. Protons stay the same. So if you have a mass of 12 and six protons, you got six neutrons. If you have a mass of 14 and six protons, you got eight neutrons. And so that's right out of the slides. We talked about that last Wednesday. And then finally, these are some review uh, questions and I've left out the term positive. I had to go back in there and do that because I, they didn't have a word list on these and they, were, and they were all over the place. So I put in a word list. And so the word positive is not in there. And you just take that because the first one here is protons are positive charged particles located in the nucleus. Well, I don't have positive up there, so you look all day for it. And that's the chemistry lab module, okay? All it does is go back and reinforce, all it does is go back and reinforce what we talked about in the lecture. The reason I'm doing this is it is assumed that you had chemistry in high school or college, okay? But some of you may not have, just like it's assumed that you had biology so you'd understand about the chapter three. And so we work through this. This is a good way to work through it to understand the principles you need to take out of the chemistry chapter. And so this is the thing to do. It's not hard. It's a Word document. You just work through it. We answered most of the questions. Okay, we answered most of the questions. And, and so don't send me an email saying, where do I get the answers to the questions? We answered it. I responded back. We talked about most of the questions in the lecture, okay? And so that's what we've done today. So I've tried to help you with the anatomical thing and I'm helping you with the chemistry thing. So we've literally done this, okay? We've literally done this except for a couple of spaces I, I skipped, but I did that so that you could do a couple on your own, all right? And uh, that's it. Anybody got any questions about anything? Your The only thing that's coming up that's due, uh, I guess the, uh, the student contract would be due next week and the first lab module, which would be the an anatomical lab module, the chapter one lab module would be due next week, but that's next week. Uh, you know, if you get it, if you get it a day or two late on the first one, that's okay because we're just, this is new. We're working through this is uh, it's a new online thing. Like I say, I revise this once I got to go back and revise it again. So if you get it a day late, that's okay. Uh, any questions for me? Uh, let me look and see what chat says. Chat. I tried emailing you, but it didn't go through. Well, you didn't use my right email. J-A-P-H-I-L-L-I -L -L -I at F-S-C-J dot E-D-U. That's my email. Everybody else has emailed me. If you go through Canvas, I can't promise you'll do anything, okay? If you go through the school email, go through the school email, the Outlook email, I have an app, I have I have Canvas apps and Outlook apps. The, the Outlook app, <clears throat> if I get email, I get a little thing right up on it that says I got an email. The Canvas app's not like that. I look on Canvas app. Canvas is hard to work with because I'll send you'll send me a message, I'll send you a message back, and you'll send me a message. And a lot of times I can't open that third message, okay, for whatever reason. So if you sent me a email through Canvas, it may not have went through. I don't know. But my email for five years is J-A-P-H-I-L-L-I -L -L -I at F-S-C-J dot E-D-U. Okay. Any other questions? You can either press your space bar and ask a question or put it up on chat. If not, the way to get through anatomy and physiology is do something every day and then take at least one day off. So anatomy and physiology, the way, get, the way get through it. Here's what I do. If I had time right now, I would download the, uh, I would download the, uh, the chemistry lab 
And at least the part that we went through, the definitions you're going to have to look up, but the part we went through, I'd start filling that in right away. Or you can wait till the lecture goes up either, either way, whatever you want to do. Uh, but if nobody's got any questions, then we're done. Thank you very much. I will see you next week, next Monday.